Hello and welcome. My name is Cameron Heismans, and today I'm going to talk a little bit more about achieving FIPS compliance with Vault. So let's get started. So where we typically see Vault, uh, sorry, FIPS is within the US government procurement. Um, I think, you know, for me, while it's centered around, you know, the USA and Canada, other regions adopt the standard, um, you know, maybe without the, the same rigor of compliance, but they look at the standard as a, as a benchmark for what needs to be achieved. Um, and when we talk about FIPS, there are two key, or, you know, two main elements. Um, one is key management, you know, how we store and transit keys. And then the other is how we do random number generation for entropy. Within the standard itself, there are four main levels of certification, right? So there's level one um, to be level one, you, you know, you must have at least one approved algorithm and use production grade equipment. Level two kind of adds to level one and says, you need the one requirements with the physical security requirements, right? So you need to provide evidence of any tampering. You need to protect the cryptographic keys and the critical security parameters or CSPs. Level three adds to level two by adding identity-based authentication and security mechanisms for tampering and response. And then finally, level four adds to level three with mechanisms to detect and respond to tampering um, with inclusions for things like environmental attacks. Uh, for what we see locally in this region, most organizations are looking at that level two space, right? And so that's what I'm going to focus on today. The reality of, of FIPS is actually that it's, it's quite challenging, right? Certification can take a long time. Um, and then what we've seen is it's typically hard to maintain. Um, typically, with a, with a product like Vault, we would certify a certain version. So we'd say you know, X version of Vault is certified to get to that point would take you know, nine to 12 months. And then every code change requires some sort of recertification. Uh, this can take a lot of time, right? Um, every code change would need to be recertified and it kind of locks you into a code version. So if we released version one uh, and released a dot fix in 1.1 to fix, you know, maybe like a, a bug or some sort of add, add a feature or function, we then need to re-go through that that whole process itself. So you can see that for a product like Vault, it's really hard to maintain um, certification around the velocity of changes, you know, the improvements and bug fixes that we do. And so the question we get a lot is, you know, is Vault FIPS certified? And the answer is, you know, not by itself. So Vault uses cryptographic modules that you know, just aren't maintained with active NIST certification, right? The certification that would be needed to be FIPS compliant. However, Vault can leverage uh, HSM to cryptographically wrap those crypto with a FIPS certified module, right? So I'll explain this in a bit, but if we're able to do that successfully, then we align with those FIPS 140-2 requirements. The key thing here is this cryptographic wrap. So what is this cryptographic wrap thing that I'm talking about and, and, and what does it mean? Well, we call this feature seal wrap and it's part of an enterprise vault uh, license. And the feature allows you to add an extra layer of encryption for any kind of supported seal. Uh, this was evaluated by Lados um, and has been found to be compliant with FIPS 142, sorry, FIPS 140-2 requirements. So when used with a FIPS 140-2 compliant seal, Vault will store those CSPs we saw for level two in a manner that's compliant with that key storage requirement and the key transit requirement. Before we get into a little bit more about seal wrap, let's first take a quick look at Vault's internal architecture. Um, to understand a bit more about what this seal is, right? At the top of the diagram, we've got this yellow box that represents the HTTP API. It's kind of like how you access or how a you know, machine would access Vault. At the very bottom in green is our storage backend, you know, what Vault is going to take encrypted and, and write to, right? The blue area is any kind of data flow between Vault and that storage backend, and, the, and it represents the barrier that's, that exists there, right? That barrier ensures that all the encrypted data is written out and data is verified and decrypted on the way in, right? So much like a bank vault, right? If I want to get into that vault, I've got to unseal, you know, open that big door to get in and get any kind of cash or anything in there. Um, I'll do the same thing with a HashiCorp vault. So out of the box, vault ships with a method to protect the seal using Shamir's secret sharing algorithm. 
right? So with Shamir's secret sharing algorithm, the premise is strong, right? We, we separate um, the master key into shards. Those shards are shared with a number of people. And we typically need a quorum of those people to enter their key to rebuild the master key and unseal the vault, right? But as per my previous slides, this doesn't really conform to the requirements of FIPS. So using a vault enterprise, we can then protect the seal with a HSM. The great thing about that is that in most cases, the HSM brings that FIPS certification, right? Vault honors that by wrapping the master key. So I guess the question is, you know, does that mean we need to wrap everything with the HSM? When we first introduced this feature, it was in Vault 0 0.6, right? And we initially took that master key and the key ring and we encrypted them with the HSM. That made the concept of auto unsealing really easy and, and you know, very possible. And we continued to iterate that. We added the recovery key, we added several other things along the way that were wrapped by that, that HSM. And that kind of point in time, we kind of stood back and said, all right, is this to get that FIPS compliant, is this something we're going to need to do for every element within Vault, right? If we did that for every element, we'd probably find that Vault would be nowhere near as performant as it is today. Um, we'd have a lot of issues with, you know, reading and writing to Vault in a high performance environment, right? So at that point, we realized that to maintain compliance, we don't actually need to wrap everything. We can take a look at these CSPs or those you know, critical security parameters that I touched on earlier and not need to wrap everything that Vault touches, right? We would still then maintain that compliance. So what's a CSP and, and what does it mean for Vault? So in short, CSPs are the keys or, or authentication data which could compromise the security of you know, the cryptographic module, right? If these things were you know, leaked or unprotected, then there'd be trouble. For Vault, they live within that barrier that we talked about earlier, right? Um, in, that, in that middle box within Vault's internal architecture. They include things like the master key, encryption keys, the key ring, any kind of recovery key that's built is also part of that CSP. Um, an example for a, a backend like the KV um, would be everything that gets written to the KV. So every key value pair um, forms part of a CSP. For something like the PKI engine, the CA's private key will also form part of the CSP. So when we use a HSM to protect these uh, CSPs, you know, how does it work? What's that flow? Well, first, we need to establish what is and isn't part of CSP. Within Vault, we have a plugin system. You know, plugins uh, typically form either an authentication or some sort of secret engine, right? Um, so per plugin, we define what is a CSP and, and what isn't. Once we've done that, we're able to take uh, anything marked as critical. And we take that information and we encrypt it uh, within Vault as we'd normally do, right? After that, we take that piece of information that's already encrypted and we transit it to the HSM and ask the HSM to also perform you know, some sort of encryption, thereby wrapping that data with the HSM key. Finally, we write that off to disk, right? What we get then is a value that's been wrapped by that HSM. We do that for, for a heap of these uh, CSPs. In some sort of uh, decryption style event, you know, the reverse is true. So we you know, bring that into Vault, decrypt it with the HSM, decrypt it with Vault's key, and then we're able to you know, retrieve the value. So I'm going to show you a bit of a demo now. Um, what I'm going to do in that demo is I've stood up a Vault cluster locally. I've also stood up a backend for that Vault cluster. And to make things a bit more visual, I'm going to use console as a back end. It allows me to dive into the console UI and kind of poke around at Vault. Um, I'm not going to really go into too much detail around adding uh, things into Vault, um, but you'll see that as we go along. Cool. So I'll just uh, bring my screen across. You can see here, uh, I'm already logged into Vault and I've got my uh, console KV. Uh, drilled into to Vault itself. So let's just have a look at a few key things within Vault. The first is within core, I can see I have as an example this key ring here. And it's interesting to note now, when I look at the key ring, I can see an encrypted value, right? 
Um, and this encrypted value is pre any kind of um, conformance seal, right? So I'm not using seal wrap at this point in time. I'm just showing you vault um, as it would typically write things, right? So the key ring would be encrypted, something like the master key you know, would be encrypted and we can see that value there. If I was to go into vault itself, I might enable a new engine. Uh, as per my slides, I'm gonna um, use something like the KV engine and I'm going to create an unwrapped amount of that uh, secret engine. What I'll do now is I'll show you this within uh, console itself. So if I go back to Vault, under the logical file system, you can see two mounts here. One's going to be for that cubby hole you saw earlier, and one's going to be for um, the wrapped uh, secret engine. The way I can determine that is to see um, this kind of detail. So right now, that engine's got nothing in it. Let me go and add a secret. And for the sake of the uh, demo, it doesn't really matter what I what I add here because you know the expectation is that this would all be encrypted. Now, when I come back to this same uh, key value pair, I can see I've got this versions tab. Within versions, I get some data. Within this, I get you know some data that's you know fully encrypted uh, by Vault. So what I've seen here is in when Vault is operating in a standard mode, i.e. it's not actually um, using a, a typical um, HSM or some sort of other conformance seal. Uh, the data just gets written and protected by Vault. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop my Vault service. I'm going to update my seal. So I'm going to use a new seal. Uh, in this case, I'm going to use the AWS KMS seal. And what that's going to allow me to do is to kind of demonstrate what we can do with seal wrap. So behind the scenes, I've gone ahead and I have um, uh, restarted Vault. So I'm going to come and log into Vault over here. You can see that Vault is should be unsealed. Great. I'm going to just uh, log in. So I'm going to grab my root key and log in itself. Oops. Let me grab that again. It's better. So I've logged in, and you can see it is still wrapped. I've still got that single mount point. If I come back to uh, my console KV now, and I look at those core parameters that live within Vault, um, the first thing that you might notice is, A, I've got a few more, right? So I've got this recovery config and a recovery key. Let's have a look at the key ring again, because we looked at that earlier. Now you can see my wrapped value is, is much bigger, right? I've, I've actually passed this through my um, validated seal that's then wrap that value in addition to Vault's uh, encryption. Um, and in this example, like I mentioned earlier, I'm using AWS KMS to do this uh, seal wrapping process for me. And it kind of gives me a little bit of information within the wrap itself about what's been used, right? So this is KMS out of US, uh, US West 1, and this is my key. The interesting thing here is that we get that information. Um, so we would expect for anything that's been seal wrapped to be able to see that, that AS uh, AWS key being exposed in terms of you know, what was being used. So I saw that for the master key. If I went to something like my recovery key, you know, you can see the same thing. If I went and looked at something like uh, the key ring itself, you know, it too has, has that. So we can see as soon as I've done the seal migration, Vault has gone ahead and said, oh, these are the CSPs and I'm going to you know, automatically wrap them for you. So Let's head back to Vault again, and I'm going to enable a new engine. I'm going to do the KV again. This time, I'm going to call this the wrapped, and I'm going to enable seal wrap for this KV. All right. Before I do that, let's just make this a little bit easier on myself, and I'm going to go to logical. And you can see I've got two mounts already. So I've got the B34D, which I think was my unwrapped, and the D2D, which I think was the um, cubby hole. So let's enable this engine get back uh, to console and we can see I've got a new one which is for MBC and it, it has no values in there. That's what I'd expect. Let me go and add some values to just get a bit of a look at this. And if I add them, yeah, it should be pretty straightforward. All right, so let's switch back to console. And we can see now that I've got this versions tab. If I go into versions, I get a single version of something and you can see now for that same data, right, the mount point of secret and the KV of foo slash bar, I get this much bigger wrapped value. 
Um, and we can also drill down and see that once again, we're using the AWS KMS uh, key for my, for my seal. So if I went ahead and, and you know, continued to flesh that out, you'd see that this pattern would, would keep repeating itself. So in terms of that demo, what I was able to show is um, Vault without a conformance seal, will just write native encrypted values to that storage backend. If I change that seal to something like AWS KMS, which is a conformance seal, it'll still use that same seal wrap process. It'll still wrap it in that same way that I talked about with the HSM. So previously, you know, what I talked about was protecting the seal with a CSP, sorry, and the CSP data with a HSM, right? And this is a validated pattern. Uh, it's one we have a letter for on our website and you'll be able to, to get a lot more detail um, under the seal wrap section of our website. But another pattern that we get asked about a lot is the one that I kind of demonstrated, which is this you know, AWS KMS pattern. Right, so if you to visualize this pattern once again, you know, here's a quick example. Right, you can see I've got the same master key encryption key, you know, that live within Vault, and I'm protecting that with KMS. Right, so we can use KMS as a service for the seal for Vault, and all the seal is exactly the same mechanism. It still protects things in the same way. Right. The interesting thing about that AWS KMS is that they too have you know, undergone FIPS 140 2 certification for the KMS service itself, right? They've actually gone one step further and said for any kind of uh, KMS which uses an endpoint, there's a FIPS certified endpoint. What this allows you to do is to transit um, traffic using you know, encrypted TLS to also meet requirements for that. I just want to be really clear though, this is not a pattern we've certified, right? To, to get this pattern you know, past any kind of auditing, you'd need to go and uh, get it through your auditors yourself. However, it is something that we see that offers the same functionality, right? It's same, same library to do seal wrap, the same protection in terms of using a FIPS compliant uh, uh, seal. So let's cover a quick recap of what we've seen today. You now, like I mentioned at the start, by itself, Vault, Vault is not FIPS compliant. However, if um, we combine it with a HSM, then we can meet those compliance requirements for the master key encryption and Vault seal wrap functionality of those CSPs. We also saw that if we combine Vault with another seal like AWS KMS, we get the same level of protection with seal wrap and you know, we can therefore meet the requirements in our own auditing or something like that. So that's all for me today. Thanks again uh, for coming along. You can reach me, Cameron, at hashicorp.com or you can visit the website for more details.